Welcome to the Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. Today is January 10th, 2024. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Genji, you want to go ahead and say a little bit about yourself in a sentence or two, and then we'll we'll get more into it. Sure, sure. Well, my name is Genji Brown, um, born in Atlanta, Georgia, raised in New England and the Bronx. So my mother's from the Bronx. My father's from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I spent the first 10 years up in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Maine. And then from 1980 to 2004, New York City, primarily the Bronx and, and about four or five years in Brooklyn. OK, OK. And why, why don't you say a little bit about both of your parents, um, uh, what they were like, um, what you know, what they did, their their kind of family history and all how they ended up uh uh, you know, from Georgia to New England to the Bronx, all of that, whatever you might oh, know about. Um, usually people like to hear me start with my father first because of his musical background, but I'll give you a quick summary on my mother. You know, we all, we all, without a mother, none of us are here. Sure. Um, so my mom, when she graduated high school in 1967, she went to Evander Childs High School in the Gun Hill section of the Bronx. And when she graduated from there, she made a, a life decision to move to Paris to be the, the nanny, the au pair for a family friend, um, a friend of, of, of her older brother. So when she went to Paris in 67, she's 17. And the following year in 68, she you know was out with her girlfriends one day in the streets of Paris and ran across Marion Brown, my dad. My father had been there for the last two years or so, maybe from 66, um, making music, uh, you know, and he, 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 he had a, he was pretty well known in the black expatriate art scene. And that scene consisted of uh, musicians, visual artists, dancers, and writers. One of the writers that my, the, the, the husband of the woman that my mother was, um, the family that my mother was the nanny for was a writer named William Melvin Kelly. And he's written many books, one called uh, A Drop of Patience, which is one of the reasons why I wrote that song for Absolution. We'll get to that later. So yeah. it was because of Paris that my parents met. My mother, like I said, she went over there and, you know, a young woman from, from the Bronx, from the Northwest Bronx, she goes to Paris, meets this man named Marion Brown, and they came back to, to, to the States in 1969, got married in my grandfather's apartment in the Soundview section of the Bronx, and um, the rest is history. Wow, wow. Uh, did your mom ever share with you what her family's stops were on on her, like, taking such a bold, a bold move at 17? My grandmother wasn't for it. My grandfather was kind of like, he was a merchant marine, so he, he, he had the spirit of the wind in his sail, per se. Yeah. And my grandmother was a little bit more like, you know, like, nah. But my granddad was still like a little bit cautious. That was his baby girl. But he, he understood the nature of her of her movement. He, he, he understood my mom in a way that my grandmother maybe didn't. It's always kind of like that sometimes. Yeah. But it shocked everyone when she came back with this um, significantly older, abstract, avant-garde jazz musician. So that took the whole Anderson clan for a big loop. It really was like, what is going on here? It, it definitely, you know, 1969, she's 19, year, 20 years old, and he's about 36 or something, 37. So it was, wow. it was, it was a bit of a trip. Wow. And with your um, with your father, did he ever share with you how he first got into music, like his very earliest exposure to, oh, to music? He got into music as a kid. Um, <clears throat> the reason why, I, well, my grandmother, who I never met, she passed away. My dad was just a teen, but she was a single mom. Marie, Marie Howard was my grand, my grandmother's name on my father's side. And, um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, she listened to bebop and hardbop. You know, that was, that's what she liked. And so my dad, you know, liked the music that my mom, it's like, you know, some of my generation playing Tribe Called Quest for my daughter. She turns 27 tomorrow. She's raised on 90s hip hop. She's born in 97, 
but she's raised on all that shit. That's yep. what she had in the house growing up. She saw me making beats on the drum machine and all that. So my dad got exposed to the music through his mom. And then he decided to, uh, you know, pick up the clarinet in junior high school or in high school. And then studied that for a bit and then moved to the saxophone because the clarinet is supposed to be a beast of an instrument. Like it just not everybody is going to make it on that one. Um, so he chose the saxophone really because the saxophone was the instrument that was really, it was like the rappers of, 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 of the fifties, you know, the horn players, the tenor sax, the, the, the trumpets and the altos. And it was a, a, a an alto Johnny Hodges that really had the sound of my father's youth. And um, yeah, he picked up the alto saxophone and stayed with it. He actually went to different colleges. He went to Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia. He was a Kappa Alpha Psi. And then from there, he went to Howard to study law. And it was there that he decided to not pursue that any further and just go head first into the music. Wow. And that was, I guess he made that departure from uh, pursuing academia in that particular avenue somewhere in the early 60s yeah um, yeah yeah and and what about um did did he ever share much with you what all went into his decision to uh become an expat for a, a little bit i mean i know a lot of people had a bunch of different motivations but it's a hard hard time um <laughs> I would say one of the most articulate expats of of the 20th century um, was James Baldwin. And so the way he articulated the 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 reason, the need, the survival for many black Americans, especially of the the What's the word I'm looking for? What's the adjective I'm looking for of the of, of the artistic mindset or the academic mindset? Um, you know, the from the the W. B. Du Bois school of thought per se, right? Um, you know, good old American racism. So that was the impetus to push a lot of people. You know, in the same way that other countries, uh, the immigrants of other countries came to the states to get away from the political, from the economic, from whatever challenges were stopping them from upward mobility and equality in their countries. Um, you know, in 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 the sense of of the European immigrants, it was it was for the most part issues of class, um, yeah. which was the the unseen kind of not unseen, it's very seen, you know, poverty is poverty. Um, for the black American, it was race and class, yep. double edged sword. So even though you could, let's say, if you were a middle class uh, Black American and you were able to rise through the, the economic ranks, you still had to deal with the, you know, you still had to deal with racism. That wasn't going anywhere. Yep. It didn't go anywhere. And a lot of times it was the, you know, it was even like Jimi Hendrix, you know, to take a little pivot. He had to go to England to team up with you know british musicians to to basically become an import to the states yep. and be the greatest musician that we ever one of the greatest musician that we ever ever born on this soil but when he was trying to do his thing here in the way that he saw it it didn't happen so he was an expatriate people don't talk about hendrix as an expatriate he absolutely was absolutely and he was discovered not discovered but his genius was brought to light you know, in 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 Britain and England, and when he came back, you know, good old America was like, "Holy shit!" You know, who's this? And he's like, "Man, we all here." So yep. that was that was one of the reasons. You know, it's just in it, the many the many facets uh, 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 and layers of racism that will push people to their brink. But at that time, um, jazz already had a big stronghold in Europe. I mean, going back to the 20s with Sidney Bechet and the, and the clarinet. He was yeah. the first black American to actually play abroad, I think in Russia, something crazy like that. Miles Davis went over in the 50s, came back depressed. He talks about it. Um, mm -hmm. Many musicians went over there, but 
when the free jazz cats went over there, there was even another reason outside of racism. It was more like that abstract movement really wasn't well received in the States, even by the American jazz population. They were really rooted in hard bop at that time. So, you know, Marion's people were just like, let's just go somewhere else where abstract art and it's any expression, be it dance, be it visually, be it, you know, writing or musically will be understood. And for that, you know, the the the, the ears of the European connoisseur, music connoisseur, um, you know, was 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 a place that he found. He found he found people that would listen to him. And uh, your, your your mom must have been one of them to to meet him and and fall in love. Or did did she meet him at a concert? Or did she? Just oh no no him? no no. So like they you know they both have to. When you talk to your parents, like two people can be in the same place at the same time and have two different stories. But when their story pretty much lines up, you know is it true? Yeah yeah. I'm gonna say this. Someone's gonna say that. But she was over there with a friend. Some friends of hers. Actually, she was. As she was an au pair, a, a nanny, she was also a photographer and a model. She was doing a couple different things. Wow. So she had a circle of of young women that she used to run with, um, some American, Black American young women. She, she was usually the youngest of, of the clique, so probably in their early to mid-20s. She was in her teens, to early 20s, in her teens at the time. And uh, they were out one day in the streets and saw this man at the cafe, and she recognized him. And to 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 her story, she said, "I approached him because I'm a photographer, and I found his, I found his features very captivating." Yeah, she says, "You know, he he wasn't the most handsome man I ever saw, but he was the most uniquely beautiful man that I ever saw at that time. That he looked like a his face looked like a piece of African art, is what she said." And to her photographic credit, many people love to take pictures and photographs of Marion and draw him because of his striking features. So that caught her eye. And then she would go to the concerts and hang out and take pictures. And, you know, she had a vision that she was going to get with him. And you know how that goes. And so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but the way the story goes, like she approached him. He didn't really approach her. He's like, man, you're too young for me. And she was like, whatever. And, you know. <laughs> and then and then she, I guess, successfully convinced him to move back to the States and and to the Bronx yeah, first, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. They um I, I don't know exactly like how that worked out, but it worked out. Yeah. They came back in 69 and then in 1970, went up to New England after I was born. I was born in Georgia, like I said, 1970, 70, they stayed there for a little bit, then went to the Bronx for a couple, and then went to New Haven. And um it was New Haven, Maine, and then Massachusetts. Oh Connecticut. I see. Connecticut Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts. That was the bounce. Wow. Okay. So just for like a little time in each place, do you have, do you have any formed memories from nah, each of those places? I mean, most, the most vivid memories I have are from Massachusetts because I was six. Okay. Yeah. Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, Maine and, 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 and New Haven, Connecticut. They're vague. I was a little what, boy. And what are, what are, what are your memories from Northampton? Well, I loved Northampton. It was, I mean, I could be a little kid. Um, I lived in a place called Hampton Gardens, which was this lower middle class um, housing complex that accepted Section 8. And it had a few Black families. It had a large amount of, of Puerto Rican families from Brooklyn. It had white American, Polish, and Italian families and Irish families. Um, so I was privileged enough to have a network and a, and a social circle of kids that were different at a very young age. What we shared in common was that our parents weren't rich, yeah, but they were rich in love. And, you know, I played with kids, like I said, you know, <laughs> as an adult, it's a privilege when your children are able to interact with children from different backgrounds at a young age, because the older you get, the more you see the divisiveness in society. But if your child can grow with a child's heart and play and fight and play and make up and get dirty and have snowball fights and eat fluffernutter sandwiches and sleep over kids' houses that are just completely different, but the same, 
it really sets the palette for a very colorful life. And so that as you do grow up and you see what society does and the traps and the, the loopholes and the, you know, the, the lines of do not cross, you know, deep down in your child's like heart, you know that things can be different because they were for you. Um, Dad was born in 31 in a Jim Crow South. And one of the best things he ever did to me for me was give me the awareness between him and my mother, give me the awareness of Black American history without teaching me and putting the weight of his experience growing up on my shoulders every day. Yeah. You know, Again, when you speak about, when I speak about, uh, you know, every generation has its own set of trauma triggers, right? And a lot of times parents pass it on to their children and that yeah. creates a child growing up saying, I don't like these people. I don't like this. I don't like that because of what their parents went through. They didn't even get a chance to experience the world for themselves yet. They already have a preconceived notion of who they are, who they're not going to interact with, right? Based on... Yeah. Why would you not believe your parents? If they're saying it, it's true. If your grandparent, if you hear this sentiment echoed in your community and in your home, then you, you know, there's got to be some validity to it. So we were always aware of the inequities of society, always, you know, I, but in the same breath between my grandfather being a merchant marine and traveling around the world, my father being a musician, my mother going to New England, uh, to a New England, you know, a, a highly prestigious college, you know, we always had black music in the black di the African diaspora in the home, but we were able to, and I was able to interact with a lot of different people. Um, and that's one thing that, you know, all music can do, but that black American music in, in all of its various branches has been able to give this country in a unadulterated, pure, you know, I don't want to say gift, but it it's, it's, it's. Absolutely. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. It is. The beautiful uh, game. Yeah. In, indigenous musical traditions that simultaneously are international. I mean, yeah. it's really, yeah, really amazing. Um, so in Northampton, were were you primarily in Northampton because your your mom was in school at that time? Is that the main reason y'all were in Northampton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she went to Smith College and then as soon as she graduated, um she moved back to New York to get her master's degree at Columbia. Okay. So she had, a, she had a specific, like, I'm going to be here. New England was all about academia for my parents. It wasn't about the society itself because it was, you know, it, again, racism has passive and it has aggressive things. So, you know, it always kind of sucks when you're the only person that looks like you. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're always being reminded that you're in the minority, yeah. In the same breath, when I did move to the Bronx in 1980, you know, my cultural upbringing from New England was so different. I felt like I was a complete outcast. It was <laughs> like it was like country mouse, city mouse. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> this shit? It was a trip, bro. I was kind of fucked up in the game. And, you know, in Massachusetts, I had friends that listened to uh, my friend's big brothers would listen to rock music, you know. So my, my first intro to rock music was through the friends of like I had a friend named Alan Pachorek. His brother Scott was about what five years older than him, so older than us. So he's listening to Boston and Jethro Tull and Rush and all of that shit. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, I had some other friends that were listening to Kiss. I could not bring any of that stuff home, especially Kiss. My mother hates. She's like, "No, you're not going to bring any of that stuff home." But I always had an ear for for for. I, I would say my first ear for rock came from growing up in Massachusetts, Northampton, and and my friend's older brothers, the music you would hear in their house. Huh. But at my mom's house, you know, she got, I got her record still here. I could pull one out now. She had, you know, I mean, she had, she had uh, anything from Bob Marley to Hugh Masekela to, you know, you name it. Wow. She, King Records. I mean, she had a whole bunch of shit from this, from the 70s. She had Fania All Star. She had Fela Kuti. Um, I mean, Funkadelic. Uh -huh. My mother's my mother's record collection was like the shit that really kept me rooted. It's why it's why I have all of these. Oh damn! Is is that is, how much of that's your mother's record collection? You think? Well, 
So I don't know if you can see those those. Bins. Oh shit! Okay, yeah, yeah. Wow. Bins hers. I got stuff in there from the '60s. That's hers from high school. Wow. Some of those records in those three bins are things that I actually that I grew up with. Like those. That's my childhood. Wow. Those bins and a few of her so, other scattered around. So you were really immersed in all kinds of music. Yeah. I mean, I not only with your dad, but with your mom too. It sounds like. I, I was immersed in more music that I could understand. I couldn't even understand it all. My father's music was the last shit that I wanted to listen to. <laughs> yeah. It was in my mind like, you know, come on, like, what is this? Who is this for? I didn't even know. Yeah. It wasn't for me. In my mind, I'm like, I can't dance to this shit. I didn't see my mother dance to it. I didn't see her girlfriends dance to it. I didn't see, you know, I didn't see that. Yeah. So I'm like, who is this for? And then when I would go spend weekends with him, um, I saw it, like they were just sitting around listening to it. I'm like, but why? No one's moving to it. And then every once in a while, I'd go to some, you know, dance, uh, uh, recite not recital, but like some abstract jazz dance. And this shit just looked. It was, you know, it, from a seven, eight year old kid. I was like, this shit is crazy in my mind. I, I didn't, I didn't see where they landed. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know who it was for. I didn't yeah. understand my dad's music until I was probably probably never fully understand it, but I didn't start to get a a, a glimpse into into it until I was about 17. I was like, oh shit. This dude is oh, okay. Uh, now, now I see it took me a while. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in, it's interesting. I mean, the you know, the like almost complete association with you know the music that you heard all around you and dancing and it being hard to understand music that was either harder if not impossible to dance to would was there a lot of dancing outside your home that you saw to music in Northampton or or was that more in the Bronx where more dancing and music I saw there? dancing in 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 within my community of Hampton Gardens spe specifically between my mother and her Puerto Rican friends from Bushwick. Yeah. It was a yeah. whole family that was from Bushwick. Um, and, you know, they would come and they, that family was huge. They must've had five or six houses of cousins and members and they would come to my mother's crib. She would throw some real dope house parties. The cops would come. She'd have to hide <laughs> weed, put it in the back. <laughs> That's why I really saw this shit in my mother's house. Wow. Then wow. by the time I moved to the Bronx, then I saw it in the streets. There wasn't nobody dancing in the streets of North uh -huh. Hampton. I'm sure. <laughs> as progressive as a city it is, it's still a puritanical town. So that shit was not nice. a little colonial, you know, <laughs> Western Massachusetts town. Beautiful town. It's, it lives in my heart forever, but you ain't see nobody in the corner and shit like that. Yeah. Like by the time 1980, Bronx, New York, it hadn't even been marketed as hip hop yet but the culture was in full swing. Uh-huh. Absolutely. It didn't have the marketing term, but you could not walk out your house and not see it or feel it because that's what culture is. It's a way of life. It's not something that you sell. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not a singular form of expression. It's everything. Absolutely. That encompasses your your daily fucking routine. You know, the quarter water is part of the culture. You know, the shit that you drink, the fucking, huh? you know, the deli on the corner with the little ham and cheese sandwiches and shit. And then across the street in the paddle ball court, you hear the older brothers with the radio, you know, and they playing their music. Or remember when I, I used to go visit my grandfather. We used to go visit him all the time. He lived on the 14th floor and the terrace apartment 14d the terrace face boynton avenue and yo there used to be jams in in, in the fucking street like literally taking the power from the street light and uh -huh. all, i was a little kid i didn't know what i was saying but i'll be on the terrace my eyes glued and then oh, i was trying to go to bed ginger okay and i'm looking out the window and i'm hearing them you know play good times and by the time i moved there i was like oh i mean this shit was happening the clothes, the, the the fucking the way people were moving, the style, the graffiti, all of it scared the shit out of me, and all of <laughs> it, 
engaged me and captured my attention like it did everyone. There was no way you could miss it. No way you could miss it. So what what part of the Bronx did you first land in? So uh, we went we went we went to um we from Soundview from the Soundview section of the Bronx uh specifically Story Avenue between Boynton Avenue and Morrison. That's okay. where that's where I got 60 plus years of family history on these two blocks in the Lafayette um estates they're called now. We called it the Lafayette Island Projects, but it was just known as Lafayette Boynton, Lafayette Morrison Houses. It was a private development that at the time was made by, created by Mitchell Lama, uh, ah. the development who were the same people who made Left Rack City and who made um, the houses up in Parkchester. All of those developments had things that were similar and all of them had slightly different architecture to them. Yeah. But So Lafayette houses weren't so big, but right across Bruckner Boulevard was Bronxdale houses and Bronxdale houses, uh -huh. one, two, and three, that's where the Black Spades was from, late 60s. Right. Bronx River Projects was a little bit further west, across Westchester Avenue, 172nd, 174th Street, Almighty Zulu Nation, up the block. Get, no, not even not even before that. Even closer to me, you got Soundview Projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're right by the water. We're right by Long Island Sound. Anytime you get projects that are right by the water, the boondocks, the fucking two-fair zone, it's always a lot of good bad and ugly shit happening simultaneously <laughs> because and the usually the police station is like a spitz distance away and most of the crazy yep. shit happens is right there yep so we had Soundview projects right there and then when you go a little bit further north there was castle hill um man the whole the whole area and especially that bronxdale area and bronx river was such a skating palace is right up the block yep the skating palace you know just had <laughs> Man, so it was there. You could not walk out of your house and not, you're going to see the Zulu Nation. You're going to see the graffiti writers. You're going to see the B-Boy. You're going to see, you know, the gold chains. You're going to see the Pumas with the fat legs. You're going to see the sheepskins. And all of this shit, like all of the shit that you would step out of your house with was subject to robbery. Uh -huh. <laughs> robbed for everything. The British walkers. I mean, anything that was nice, someone would take it off of you. So it was just like... I'm from Massachusetts. I'm like, what the hell is all of this? I used to visit my grandfather, but I didn't have to live there. I didn't have to go to school. Yeah, sure. I didn't have to really interact on a sandbox level that deep on a playground level. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm from. The sound, the sound view, the sound view section of the Bronx. Okay, yeah. And so your grandpa already lived there, so it's a natural place for you and your mom. Yeah, to... that's like that. He had already lived there. So we just we lived with him, and then from there we moved to another building in the in the development. And um yeah, that's what that's what my roots are. Story Avenue between Boynton and Morrison. Was was your grandmother still alive when you moved back to the Bronx? Yeah, but she had already when my grandparents split in '67, so yeah, my grandmother went to L.A. Oh, I see. My grandmother I see, lived I see. in L.A. from '67 until her passing in 1994. Um, wow, one of the first places she lived in L.A. <laughs> from '67 to '69 was in the jungle. And if you've done any type of research huh. or anything about LA, the jungle became a very active neighborhood for um it, it was the home of the Black Peacestone Nation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Where Micah Nine and AC alone from the Freestyle Fellowship are from. And wow. when I went out to LA in 93, I go and meet them. And I said, I told my grandma, I said, I'm going over to Potomac Avenue. And she's Potomac, that's the jungle. What the hell are you doing over there? I said, I know some dudes, you know, so what kind of dudes? I said some. <laughs> Some rappers for some music. She said, boy, you are not going to the jungle. Well, I went. <laughs> I had no clue to the depths of its history at the time. I was, you know, I was I was ignorant to, to that side of town. Yeah, sure, um, sure. I had no idea. But I learned quick, like, be careful coming in and out the jungle. But, yeah, my grandmother lived in L.A. from 67 to 1994. Wow. And when did your grandpa pass? 96. 96. Okay, okay. So, they wow, okay, they both lived a long time then. Yeah, long, not long enough, but as long yeah. as they were supposed to. Yeah. Um, and uh, so were you in the Bronx more or less the entire time uh, that you were in New York City or you, you moved in and out of the Bronx some? Yeah, so I moved out of the Bronx twice. Um, okay. First time was in 1988. October of 88 to June of 89. 
not a full year, but a season. Yeah. That was um at the peak of 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 of, of absolution's first, you know, of, of that. Okay, I, I see. Sergio, Sergio and I had an apartment in Williamsburg, Brooklyn on 26 Hope Street. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. I see. So that's that's so gonna be there. We lived there. I got pictures, I got the receipts. It was a really wild little experience. And then I moved back to the Bronx. And then I removed back out to Brooklyn around the fall or early winter of 91. I lived on 64 St. James Place between Lafayette and Gates. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So right down the block, the notorious B.I.G. lived. Yeah. Down Lafayette Avenue at the Lafayette Garden, LG Projects. The great Easy Moby lived. Um, it was no matter where I went, I was smack dab in the middle of a lot of, you know, but that was New York at the time. Yeah, sure. Sure. That was it was just one huge, you know, that was just New York at the time. Yeah, you couldn't avoid it. <laughs> um no, it was everywhere. Uh so when you move when you first moved to the Bronx. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit more about the adjustment process? I'm sure part of that had to do with the school that you started going to and all of that, but talk a little bit more about uh, how that was like for you. So the adjustment process really had a lot to do with learning how not to get bullied. I was bullied a lot. Mm. I didn't grow up in those early formative years fighting in the playground. Yeah. So it was a whole different level of maturity that 10 year olds had in the Bronx than they did in, in Northampton. Yeah. In Northampton, I thought I was hip and cool. Cause my mother was, yeah. And when I got to the Bronx, I was like, Oh shit. You know, I learned, you know, they told me I was soft and I was like, what's that? And I soon found out that I wasn't hard. <laughs> right. I didn't understand how kids could be so, you know, so mean. Yeah, sure. But I soon understood why. Even if I couldn't articulate it, I was like, oh, shit. You know, we're really out here fending for ourselves and struggling and parents are struggling. And it's just a different, a different set of mechanisms that you have to, you know, employ. And that's where the beauty of like the literal and figurative colorization the way that you know young people a young community of 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 of, of born in hip hop just colored a decimated city a, a a dirty ass bronx brooklyn lower east side man and just made it a colorful place to play huh? and to create things because you know just the stark reality of what it was that's not going to make you happy yeah yeah it's not designed to it's designed to break your spirit it's not designed to lift it. So we found ways. Kids are the ultimate survivors to find happiness. They will do it. And it was literally colorful. So I said, okay, if I'm not going to be good at like knocking people out, I got to find something to be good at. Yeah. So I started learning. I, I could dance and I started to pop and lock and shit. Okay. Crazy. Um. And graffiti always caught my eye. When I went to my first year in junior high school, junior high school 125, I, I, I noticed this kid and I had seen this tag around the neighborhood. And for some reason, it really like caught my eye and it was Dean, D-E-E-M. Mm -hmm. So the first time I, I remember my first day or two at, in, in junior high school 125, I saw this kid with a silver name buckle and it said Sergio. And it was silver. And I was like, kid just looked real cool to me. And yeah. for some reason, we didn't become friends then, but I noticed him. Yeah. He was two years older than me. So when I came in in seventh grade, he was in his last year in ninth grade. Then he went to high school. I never saw him again until a few years later. Um, When I started hanging out in high school, I went to Stevenson High School and I had some friends from, from, from Southern Boulevard area. Yeah. 
I start hanging out with them and I re-meet him. And Sergio's like, yo, he thought I was a cool kid. Again, he was more mature than I was at the time. Uh, he was already writing on trains and he just, he he was already in another lane. But um, he started talking to me and getting me in, into like freestyle music. Sure. And which was really big in the Latino community. The crossover was like between hip hop and that was, you know, Mantronics and Soul Sonic Force, which was really electro. And then from there you went to freestyle. It was a really interesting transition sonically of how you went boom, boom, boom. And, you know, you had the Puerto Rican kids doing that, black kids doing that, but everybody doing it in the same neighborhood. So, you know, you just kind of gravitated towards the mix or wherever you want to go. Yeah, sure. Um, but even prior to that, like, it's funny because by the time I started hanging out with him and got introduced to freestyle, the new wave, then rock, I had already been exposed to some dudes who were like heavy metal heads in the Bronx and they weren't, they weren't white cats. They were Puerto yeah, Rican, sure. a few Puerto Rican brothers that were like, it was maybe five of us, but you know, I remember this dude, I have a friend named Sheldon. Sheldon's older brother's name was Scooter. I don't even remember his real name. Scooter was always brawling, like stocky and boom, he used to walk. It's like, here comes Scooter. Like he could just, like a shorter Debo, but real cool, but quiet, but you didn't want to fuck with him. Yeah. Scooter had a Scooter had a homeboy named Owen. They called him MC Owen because he always wore an MC jacket and fucking boots. Yep. And Owen was black American, but he also was like Native American because he had this long ponytail. Huh. Owen was fucking, he was a real handsome dude, but mean, and he was captivating. Scooter and Owen were a fucking duo. And Scooter, I mean, Owen, where, where Scooter was like sheepskin and Kango, straight hip hop shit. Yeah. MC Owen was like, like fucking heavy metal. And these dudes were like this. They wow. rode tight. And even if Scooter, even if even if um uh, uh, uh Owen wasn't listening to heavy metal, his whole vibe was like boots to the fucking ground. Uh huh. You know what I mean? And 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 it was really deep. It like caught my mind. And then 84, 85, I used to hang out with some kids. Also some dudes who I used to write graffiti with in the hallways, toy shit, but still. <laughs> um, yeah, we used to go, I used to go to my man's house. He's two, one dude named Carlton and then Mark Maldonado. Mark was Puerto Rican, Carlton was black. They lived in the same projects and Monroe projects. And I'd go to Carlton's house and we'd watch. There was this heavy metal show on, on, on public access TV back in the 80s. I forget the name. We used to I, get, yeah, I've, 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 I, I know what you're talking about. I it was on, it was on public but, access. Do some digging yeah. and you'll find out. Yeah. And, yo, we used to go to the park, smoke little tray bags, drink 40s, go up to his crib and watch the fucking heavy metal shit. People thought we were crazy, <laughs> but it was like, it was, it was maybe two or three of us, or maybe four of us, black and poor Rican kids listening to the heavy metal. Were, right. were these kids you met at, 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 at Adelaide Stevens in high school or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met him in junior high school and then kept knowing him in high school. And it was just a little, there's a few of us. Yeah. There's a few of us. So the rock shit was always there. Africa Bambada had a mohawk, which was always kind of like a standout thing. Yeah, sure. Um, Planet Rock. It's funny because even like the Cold Crush brothers and a lot of rappers, especially the Cold Crush brothers, they start dressing all wow with fucking studs and shit because punk rock shit style was little by little you know you saw the movie wild style and it shows oh, yeah. you for sure shows <laughs> you right how things did this at the end boom and then styles and little different aesthetics are traveling to different boroughs and by 85 it's, it's different than it was in 82 and 81 it was a whole nother thing and shit is starting to mix and match a little bit you had this this graffiti crew, many of them, but two of the most prolific graffiti crews uh, 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 from the Bronx, artistically, UA, United Artists, those, they uh -huh. were all into rock. Yep, yep. And then 
vandal wise and beat you up wise and violent wise npc mars park crew they were all into rock all too into heavy metal yep so graffiti had everything it it, it and that's the whole other conversation where it brought everything together is because it predated everything it was just like what you're in the city you're old grab you listen to whatever the fuck you didn't have to listen to rap to write graffiti you write graffiti right. listen to whatever you want to dudes in the 70s who was writing grab didn't have no damn rap to listen to right so you know like all of that shit was there it was really literally like you walk out your house and you get on the subway and you're in Hunts Point and you get off in Hunts Point and it's Southern Boulevard and it's all the Puerto Rican brothers and you hear the Freestyle and the TKA and the Brenda K Star and you get on the six train, you go back up north, you get off fucking Soundview, Morrison or Elder and boom, on one side you got this, Bronxdale, and on the other side you got Bronx River. So there's your hip hop shit, whatever you want to call it. And then you go further up to Castle Hill and then go up to Pelham Bay and you got metal. It's all on the huh. same fucking train. Yep. Then by the time you get to the after place in East Village, it's a it's a rap. It's and now it now you're just in it's just it's whatever, you know? <laughs> it's like it's you're just in a whole nother a whole nother world. So so what what what's some of um the either albums you owned or songs you heard um that like stuck with you the most from that period of your musical formation doesn't have to be you know rock heavy metal it could be any any music genre but but the ones that really like formed you when you were a teenager i'm just gonna go whatever comes top of mind first the art of noise sure. the art of noise uh-huh that shit was crazy yeah um Obviously, Sucker MCs, when that came out, it was a whole other sound. Yeah. Having the drums up front like that. Um, Tila Rock, It's Yours was big. Uh-huh. Tila Rock was big. Tila Rock was huge. Uh, I mean, there was so much stuff. So much stuff. So much stuff. I'm trying to feel my teenage self and not my... What happens is when you talk to guys our age who now have a, an anthology of what they should have been into back in the yeah, day, sure. maybe they weren't. They're speaking from a, 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 a this mindset, but knowing... You, you know what I mean? It's, it's hard to, to get back but under the layers. Everything was there, but not everybody was into everything at the same time. That's right. That's right. That's my opinion. And and most of us were spectators. Not everyone was a star at anything. Sure. There were the ghetto stars. There were the 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 the, the people that were hood famous, but most of us were fucking fans. Yep. And they did it for us. Yeah. For sure. They did it for the hood. I was that, you know, they they did it for they wanted to inspire us, but you know, I was so there's there's a lot of stuff that 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 I'm trying to remember based off of like what did I really like as a kid and not what I should have liked as a kid based on my timeline. It's hard it's hard to hard to at this point uh, it's hard to separate there. because the conversation has been so you know prevalent for the last 20, 30 years. And that's you know, right. Most of us were in the stands, man. Yep. Not everybody's on the stage. There's not enough yep. room on the stage for everybody. That's right. That's right. So let's 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 uh go to some more of the music on the streets for you. Are there places that you went to? I mean, obviously it was happening all around you, but places you went to on a regular basis, whether you know, community centers, uh PALs, things like that for uh for music, uh dances, whatever it might be. In the early 80s, I went to the Skating Palace. Yeah. 30 Soundview Avenue. It's now Channel 12, the Bronx. Yep. Before that, it was Cable Vision. My grandpa first took me there, but they used to have jams at 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 at, at the Skating Palace. I was young. Sure. So I couldn't go to the shit where, you know, that started at 9 or 10 o'clock. That's right. Oh. When I was in junior high school, they used to have like 
I don't know if they call it the Pee Wee dance. I forget, but they had little after school jams with the shorties. <laughs> 12 to 14. It was quick, right? It shit would start around 4 35 o'clock on the weekends. You go home, boom, drop off your bags, you get ready, and you go to the skating palace. Wow, that was fun. And it was a dance. So we weren't even sometimes you would skate, but other times it was just a dance. You could just dance on the on the you, you didn't have to skate. And it was the shooties jam. Then you had to get out by like 7 30 or so. It was probably two hours for us. But that was a long time, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and then when you're leaving, you're seeing all the older kids come through. And you're like, damn, I wish I could, you know, fuck. And you see the flyers, the buddy Esquire flyers, and uh -huh. all the other you know, and you're like, oh shit, fantastic, romantic, cold crush, jazzy five and soul sonic and this person and that person. And then we used to dance in the playground and in the basement, in the laundry room and at school. But I didn't go to a lot of clubs in the Bronx when I was young. I didn't really start going to different clubs until I went to Manhattan. And I was old enough now to stretch out and not be on the leash of my mom. My mom had a, a necessary leash. Yeah. It wasn't too short, but it wasn't long enough where I could hang myself. I was always trying to stretch its length the older I got. Sure. The thing I wanted to do was happening in a place that I shouldn't really have no business being. That's where all the good shit is at. Yep. <laughs> no fucking this being at the devil's nest at 15 years old on Webster and East Tremont, but I found a way to sneak and lie and get up in there. <laughs> I had no business being there at like 15. I found a way. I did it at least once or twice. You know, passed out one night. It was so fucking hot. I had to carry my little skinny ass out. <laughs> but I was there, you know. Say so I went. Uh, and and but what? I, but I was a little kid, you know. Like again, I wasn't a tough kid. I wasn't a hard kid. I wasn't, you know. I, 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 I'm so glad in a way that I wasn't that my that I didn't peak back then because I wouldn't be able to be the adult that I am now. Sure, absolutely. And uh, what around what time did you first start? getting into New York hardcore, that whole scene in general. So that comes from Sergio. So Sergio, I start hanging out Sergio. with him weekends. I go down to the East, to the West Village first, because there was a, a if you want it, for lack of a better word, there was a pilgrimage, but there was a progression. Yeah. At the time, at least for me. Sure. I didn't go straight to the Lower East Side. That would have been like, you know, suicide or like, oh, let me just start drinking heavy. Yeah. So you go to the West Village first, which was a little bit more inviting. It could still, you could still, it's not that you could get hurt. It wasn't as dangerous, but it was definitely, you. It, it, it had its elements. You could really get messed up with some bad drugs or you could get hustled in Washington Square Park. Like, But St. Mark's Place, you know, 8th Street in the 80s was just, it was amazing. That was the first place you landed. They had all these amazing stores with clothes and shirts and music and incense. And then you find your way to Washington Square Park, which is mind blowing. And then a little bit, you know, south of that is Bleaker Bob's. And that's the first record store you go to. And then you get some falafels at the spot on McDougal Street. And then you get a silver ring from the fucking jewelry on McDougal Street. And then, you know, OK, and you get a little MC jacket. And then you start get some creepers and then little by little you start heading east and then you go to St. Mark's place. And now you're in, what is it? Uh, first, uh, third Avenue Bowery. Right. Huh? And you go oh, sounds records is there. And that's another record store, the music. Boom. And then you get to second Avenue, like, Oh shit, it's starting to change. And Gem Star is there. Gem whatever used to be there. The, the fucking soda, soda shit. Newsstand. You go there and you find some shit to look at. But really, you're like, oh, I want to go to First Avenue. Oh, now you go to First Avenue. And then, oh, from First Avenue, then there's Avenue Way, and then there's Tompkins Square Park. 
And Tompkins, the difference between Tompkins Square Park and Washington Square Park <laughs> was night and day. Uh-huh. It was night and day. So most of us stopped at Avenue A. By the time you got to Avenue A, you're like, oh, wow, oh, shit. And then there's B, C, and D, which you really had no business being at either. Yeah, sure. Alphabet City, you really had no business being at. Um, But... So yeah, I, I I I start going down there, and you know, you start listening to punk rock first, and get into that, and then start checking out hardcore bands. And for me, um, segue between punk and hardcore was like for a lot of kids, but for me, it was the Bad Brains, and they were necessary because I didn't see many black faces nor black musicians. So seeing them, I also understood the the history of rock and roll in America. Sure. But the bad brains validated that, yeah, there's a place here for me. Yeah. Right? And yeah. everybody loved them because their musicianship and their stage shit and, just, and their, their stage show and just their whole presence was um, uncanny. And it just had a mythical, legendary, you know, by 86, they are already been in New York, but since 80 or something. Yeah. Maybe 79, 79 even, I think. Maybe. 79, right? So yeah. they're yeah. already like, they're a landmark. And but the first group that really, I mean, they really just their impact. The, the Bad Brains had a had a had a had a you know a, had a lifelong impact on me. We could talk about that forever. But the one group sonically where I was able to hear where I was coming from, the Bronx and the subways and all that shit, and then where I landed, the Lower East Side was the Chromax. Sure. And largely because of the rhythm section between Harley Flanagan and Mackie Jason. Yeah. And then the lyrical presence of John Joseph at the time just made it like the scariest, most interesting shit. But the the music, the beats, the beats. You know, when you hear the intro to We Gotta Know and it just brings you into that album, Absolutely. there's nowhere you can go until that record's over and then you're stuck and you're saying, did I just get beat up or did I just get reborn? And it was a little bit of both. It was like getting jumped into a gang. That's that's a a beautiful way to put it. I mean, it really it is. It's like getting jumped into a fucking gang. You got. I just got goosebumps thinking about that because that was the band that made me say, if the Bad Brains said, "Okay, you can do this from a from a from an ethnic standpoint," their musicianship was on another level. So most people weren't fucking yeah. with. Them. That's right. But. Harley had a natural musicianship that probably no one else on the Lower East Side had. Not probably. I'm going to say that no one else had a knack, a natural knack at the music like he did. He had a, it's like he was born with this gift. Yeah. And he and I haven't spoken in many years, but his influence on, on that part of the culture, on that culture, um, you know, whatever you want to say about him is whatever you want to say about him. Um, and some of the most amazing and lifelong impactful artists have been controversial since the day they were born. And both him and John share that no matter what you may feel or think about anything, their their imprint. It was almost like, to me, the age of quarrel was what the Lower East sounded like in the same way that Nas's Illmatic was what Queensbridge sounded like. If you had never been to Queensbridge, and I never spent no damn time in Queensbridge, but I've been to the projects, I was like, yes. this is what the fucking projects, the type of nigga that be pissing in the elevator, the visuals that Nas brought in Illmatic to 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 his environment was the way that the Cro-Mags did in '86 with the Age of Quarrel. Absolutely, it doesn't take away anything from any of the other hardcore bands, but the the it was so visual. It was like 
and you, I know. you read the lyrics and you listen to it. What the fuck happened with that? Shit? I don't know. I don't know why. I clapped. I just clapped. And some, that was some, <laughs> some what, fireworks what, went off. Mac, yeah, Mac, <laughs> crazy shit. Um, but that that group, man, they really. And so I'm in the Lower East Side now, and I'm like, I'm going to go the hardcore route rather than the punk rock route. Sergio at the time went more the punk rock route, but we were still like this, but yeah. similar to like Owen and Scooter. Yeah. Right? Like I saw hardcore more like it was almost an extension of, 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 of hip hop in a way for me. Sure. And punk was, it was just different. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was different and beautiful and and uniqueness, but I gravitated towards the hardcore shit because I was like, yo, these motherfuckers ain't playing. They're not playing around. Yeah. And it, it scared me the same way that the culture of hip hop scared me. And it was like, in order to find your place in it, you had to find your strength in it. Sure. You know, you had to like, your physical strength, even, you know, for, 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 I saw hardcore kids mossing and slamming. I saw these dudes doing shit. They look like martial artists in the mosh pit. I said, oh, I got to do that. And when you're really scared of something, you should try it. The first day I went to uh, uh, to CB's, I went by myself. I saw Murphy's Law and it scared the shit out of oh, me. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> But you know, uh, two years later, I'm on the fucking stage. Yep. So wow. I get it, it scared straight, like you know, no pun intended. Wow. It, it scared the shit out of me, but it was like a beautiful horror flick. It was like, yo, this shit is dope. I gotta see this shit again. And the Chrome Mags were definitely the bad brains. The bad brains were my brain, but the Chrome Mags were my heart. Absolutely. What? What's the first time you saw well, both Bad Brains and Chromags uh live? So it's it's interestingly enough, I didn't see either in by 86, 87, you know, these guys are already like, oh man, you know, you guys are new. So yeah. First time I saw the Bad Brains was at um Rock Hotel at the Ritz before it became Webster Hall. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I didn't see them at 171A. I didn't see them at the Jane Street Rock Hotel. I didn't see them in Max's Kansas City. You see, this is this is really important stuff because sometimes when you have all of these historical landmarks, a lot of guys my age like to embellish on where they were, but the real ones that were there were like, no, you fucking weren't. So yep. I wasn't at them spots. I didn't see the Bad Brains at C. Only time I saw the Bad Brains at CBG was on a fucking DVD, bro. I ain't see them. <laughs> Sure, sure. I saw Dr. No and watched in Tompkins Square Park. Yeah. I saw him in the streets. I never met HR in my life, but I met I met Daryl and Gary and never met Earl. Yeah. I met Daryl and Gary and shook their hands and smoked a spliff with them and conversed with them. You know, enough times. I can't say that, yeah, that was those are my brothers, but they were definitely people who I held in the highest of regard. I had enough. A few and, and the interaction that I had with them was because I had interactions with I had friendships with the Chromags with John and Harley. So yeah, you know, they 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 had that. Um the first time I saw the Chromags was also at the Ritz. Oh, okay, I see. Mayhem. The Ritz, I didn't see, I never saw them at CB's. You know, I my my CB shit was, you know, I saw Murphy's at CB's, I saw Anecdote at CB's. And then all of that 87, 88 stuff and sick of it all. I saw them at CBs and breakdown yeah. and rock wheel and crackdown and side by side. But I saw the Chromags on the big stage at the time, like the Ritz Webster Hall, that was the big stage. Sure. The biggest stage I saw them at was at the Beacon. They played with anthrax in, in the Oh, and the okay. And bananas. Yeah. I bet. I felt like they were going to, man, that shit was crazy. It was amazing, but it was crazy. So when uh, when you were getting into the uh, the scene and all, and you were going back to the Bronx and all, was it just you and Sergio who were, who were pretty much into it from the Bronx that you knew, or were there other people who were into it too? Well, I had a friend named Nicholas Colon from Hunts Point who I brought into. He was my man from elementary school. Yeah. And Nick would come. 
But at the time, I met some other Latin brothers and sisters from Queens and from the Bronx that lived in different sides of the town. Yeah. Them in the Lower East Side, but they weren't from my nest. Sure. I only brought like one dude from my nest. That was a dude named Nicholas Cologne. Nobody yeah. they thought it was crazy. They thought I was a devil worshiper. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't cool. It was like, damn, Jens, you really on some white boy shit. You really bugging. That's what everybody said. <laughs> I can only imagine, yeah. It's behind that shit. I lost friendships behind it. You know, when you're when you're seeking your own path, you're gonna lose what you'll gain more. Yeah. So no, it wasn't like five or six of us on the train going to slam dance and fucking nah. It was me and Serge. Yep. Go each other down on the way down and the way up because someone was always fucking with us. Yep. Then, you know, when I was off on my own, I was off on my own, and then he was off on his own. But we both left the Bronx in 88, and he never went back. Yeah. I went back. Sergio never went back. He went back, you know, for his family, but he never went back to live. Yeah, sure. So we only had maybe two years between 80, me and him together between 80, yeah. 88 ish traveling back and forth but during that time we would definitely we had the buddy system the subway was dangerous and he'd be on the subway with a fucking magenta a magenta huh. or purple or whatever color he chose mohawk and oh my god <laughs> no one liked it he was always more visibly like brash than i was i was kind of conservative but sergio didn't give a fuck he was full throttle yeah, I was going to ask you if you started dressing differently at all, or you just more or I less did. kept the same. I did dress differently, but and it was noticeable. So to my peers in the Bronx, it was like I was dressing down. I was dressing like a bum. To quote them, you like a fucking bum, Ginge. <laughs> that, that's what it was. Just that in many different ways. Like, you fucking wild. He like a bum. <laughs> <laughs> yo, they call you a bum. You could, you could, yo, a bum is like this term that you could, it could be your style, your attitude, or the fact that you just don't do shit, but like be <laughs> bum. You, you, you didn't crease your jeans and have uh, the fresh oh, sneakers yeah, on. No, all I, that. I didn't give a fuck. I was like, a little <laughs> my mother, everybody's like, what are you doing? Why, are you, why are you dressing down? I was like, nah, man, this shit is whack. I don't care about that shit no more. So, so what, what, what did your mom uh, think about all of this development in your life? I mean, you know, she was a, she was a, she was a, 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 a in, 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 in the late sixties, she used to go down to Washington Square Park and, and my dad was, you know, he's got a song called 27 Cooper Square. So he was down in the valley. He was playing at Slugs on yeah. Avenue before. So it, it really was not a pocket, but they weren't like, yay, go be a punk. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> sure. Hardcore and slam dance. We love it. Like, no, they didn't say that. But, you know, their whole thing was just hoping that the streets didn't get me because no matter where you were, the traps were there, the danger was there. So, you know, whether it, I, I honestly didn't have the heart to do some of the things that needed to be done you know on the uptown side of stuff i wanted to go but i didn't i didn't know people i mean i, I never went to disco fever i wanted to i didn't i was young i never went to the rooftop Oof! i might not have made it out alive like you know you didn't go there by yourself sure that was big boy shit. So if you were a little dude going to these clubs, you had to have older brothers take you and protect you because it was not for the faint of heart. I never went to Roseland. I never went to Latin Quarter. I didn't do any of that shit. By the time I was old enough, I was going to CBs. I was going to fucking Pyramid Club. I was, you know, once or twice at four in the morning that saved the robots. Yeah. I was to the world on Avenue C. I was going, I was in, I chose, I chose that danger zone. Sure. It was everything was a danger zone, like I said, all of it. 
But um, yeah, by the time I was old enough to spread my wings, it was it was it was all about that. And then by the time I left the scene in '89, I was in this like, what do I do? Yeah, I went to audio engineering school at the Institute of Audio Research because of hardcore, because of the late great Jerry Williams. He was a mentor of ours and of mine. And he was an engineer, a live sound engineer, recording engineer. And he, it was his influence and his inspiration that, uh, and him taking me into the studio one night. And from there, I was like, okay, now I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to engineering school. Sure. Did that. And then when I started looking for internships, I wound up just two blocks west Three blocks west. Now I'm not in the East Village anymore. I'm in Soho. Yeah. Green Street recording on Spring, on a, a Green Street between Prince and Spring. A world apart, five minutes away. Yeah. Yeah. A world apart, five minutes away. And I become an intern at Green Street recording in the spring of 1991. In the summer of 1991, I meet Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth, and that just blew, they blew my mind the same way the Crow Mags blew my mind. When I heard Pete and C.L. shit, I was like, oh my God, now this is what I want to do. And I had Eric Sadler from the Bomb Squad production as one of my early mentors. He had just left the Bomb Squad, but the year before that, that studio had produced the platinum album for Ice Cube, America's Most Wanted. The year before that, they did Public Enemy um uh, 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 not just a nation of millions, but the third joint, Fear of Black Planet. Oh yeah, Fear of Black Planet. Yeah, that shit had you know Green Street had already history. I walked into that, I was like, oh my god, this is crazy. Wow. So, you know, I start working in that what they call golden era. Absolutely, and at then, but again, you knew that this shit was extra special because the city was extra special. The culture was extra special. You know, the, the graffiti was extra special. Soho was A-OK, -okay, R-I-S, and, you know, all and Reese. And I knew Reese, real cool cat, shout out. Um, And I didn't know Wolf and Ven, but I knew Reese and Mesh. And, you know, these guys, they had all those parking lots, and Soho was just smashed with that crew. It was just... It was a big home with different rooms at the time, you know, and you would just live in different rooms based on where your head was at in New York. Huh. That's a good way to put it. Um, and, and we'll we'll get some more into into that in a second, but uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about Absolution and um, and how that came to be. Uh, and I know it's a relatively short part of your life, but. Um, it's, significant, though. it's short but significant it's like one of those relationships that didn't last forever but last forever yeah sure you know that, that relationship that really shapes you because it wasn't supposed to last forever but it was supposed to shape a part of you forever sure and Gavin I had met him and he was one of the first people I met in 86 he was already, he already had a, a, a presence he was in a band, New York Hood. So again, not again, but you had spectators and you had people in bands. Yeah. You in the band, it was a social, certain social hierarchy because you was in the band. Sure. Your band was good. Your status was risen a little higher. Um, so Gavin was always right in the middle of, you know, the shit that was happening. He was a presence and... I met him. It's, I think Sergio and I met him around the same time. I don't know, it's, but around the same time. Yeah, sure. So he sees me do my 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 progression from West Village to East Village, going to shows, and then the hardcore matinee. So the hardcore matinee was just such an amazing thing because. You could be any age and go. You could be twelve or sixteen or yeah. twenty two. It's probably, it was like, these things don't exist now. I know. It's very true. These things don't exist, you know, nowhere. Fucking nowhere. And it's so sad because 
the form of dancing is not as important or the style of dancing is not as important as the expression of it. Sure. And kids were dancing. And so, I mean, you think about it, you think about Brother Freddie from Madball, like he's raised in that. He was a little kid. And although his brother's who his brother is, Roger. Yep. You know, still like there were other 12 and 13 or 14 year old kids who didn't have a big brother, but they were there. They were there, yeah, yeah. Rest in peace, Todd Youth was already he he another one who was young there. By the time I got there, he's in war zone. He's already prolific, you know. So similar to hip hop, this culture was created by kids. It was always some older kids, but sure. Kids there, you know, like fucking kids. Under 20, under 18, yeah. shaping this, shaping this thing that would last much longer than we could see, than we could even think about. Sure. Yeah, the hardcore matinee was like, all right, you know, people met. And the more you go every Sunday, you develop relationships. And the harder you dance in the pit, you get respect. Yeah. And it wasn't about how much you could drink or smoke or fight, but can you handle yourself in the pit? Yeah. Certain bands, the mayhem was much heavier than other bands. There was a fucking gaping hole in the floor in CB, so in the right in front of the stage. The shit you could break your ankle. So the more you went, the more you survived that. And you were like, it was like, again, as I like getting jumped into a gang. Yeah, sure. Right. Gavin saw that. He liked the way I moved in the pit. And one day he says, hey, you know, you let's talk. Man, I got an idea. I want to make a band. And I was like, I can't do shit. Ironically, I was in this little punk rock throw together band with Sergio and, and a dude named Chemo and a woman named Sol, Sol, Soledad, Soli who I think is also no longer with us. And we used to go to this jazz studio that my father gave us access to that he knew. And I thought I was going to be a drummer in a punk rock group. I was terrible. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. So that, huh, that that's, that's before absolution then, huh? We didn't have a name. It was so bad. Yeah. I was, I was bad. So, so Gavin yeah, was like, we'll figure it out. You got good energy. Well, I went away with my dad for the summer of 87. He took me. I went over to Europe with him after I graduated high school. When I came back in August, started rehearsing with Absolution, August of 87. And by January of 88, we had our first show at CB's. Uh, okay. Someone, I, I think we might have a, a first show somewhere else, but that, in my mind, I'm sure there was a, a preliminary, but that was like, that was the first joint. Sure, sure, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure there was another little gig prior. I can't remember. I really don't. That's fine. That's fine. But yeah, C CB's was that 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 CB's in January radiates when it first it was, really. It was on Gavin's out. birthday, January twenty fourth, eighty eight. Yeah. He had just turned twenty. Ah, okay, okay, wow. Do you remember was, who you played with? Yeah. Absolution, Crackdown, Raw Deal, sick of it all. Oh, okay, okay, wow. Wow, and what, what was the energy like in that show, from your from your end, anyway? First off, I was just happy to be there. Second off, all those bands were the bands that I really loved at the time I had Jason Crackdown and Damon Crackdown, I was real cool with them. Jason, Jason, that was my man. Yeah. That was my dude. He really cared for me. And so did Damon, the bass player. Richie was cool. I didn't really have a relationship with him too much. But between Damon and Jason, I did. We talked on the telephone. They lived in Long Island. Jason protected me. He made sure that nobody would fuck with me. Yeah. I was always, I always had people that looked out like, all right, 
when it was time for me to fight, I fought, but I always had people that wouldn't let me become the victim of unnecessary bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful for that. And that, that was true in the Bronx and that was true in the hardcore scene. You know, again, I always had to, it was times when I had to like, this is on you, bro. You got to do what you got to do. But Jason, Jason, Jason surface looked out. So to be able to open up for crackdown, the raw deal guys, they were fucking smoking at the time. And then sick of it all. They're another group that just, I don't think there was ever a time when they weren't good. Yeah. Yeah. But man, like they, 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 they would, uh, man, Louie was always real cool with me. All of them, all of them, they would just, it was just an amazing for, for that for that to be our first show at CB's, that's why it stands out as as our first show because Yeah, makes sense. The others, if there was one or two beforehand, I really don't remember. Someone else could say, Oh yeah, it was I don't know. Thank you work for it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember the shirt um, I cut off. It was a it was a white t shirt cut off and it had a bad it was a bootleg bad brain shirt that I bought from fucking A Street. <laughs> as as far as um the writing of the songs uh went were were you the primary or the only lyricist primary. for absolution yeah I'm lyricist. gavin would also write some lyrics and he would write ideas and then give them to me and i would incorporate them but for the most part like, I think Take Control was something that we wrote together. But for the most part, once I started really flowing with the pen, Gavin was like, go. And the song I Am, I co-wrote with the late Alan Peters, our first bass player. That was his, oh, song. Okay. It was his song and his concept. I wow. Am. And at the time when you were writing the lyrics... Did you, were you, was there a conscious kind of movement? I mean, the, the the lyrics from Absolution just, at least to me, stand stand out as very unique compared to some, you know, pretty much any other hardcore band at the time. Um, was that a conscious thing on, on your part or just a natural kind of outflow of your life? Art is conscious and subconscious. Sure. So you're consciously going to sit down and create but when you're really in that zone, if I wrote songs about beating people up and living in squats, I would have been a liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The thing that both hardcore and hip hop at the time respected your truth not your lies. Yeah. So, with that being said, my mother was a really mature writer and poet when she was a teenager. I had read some of her notebooks and I was like, wow. So she was probably, not probably, she was a big influence on letting my stream of consciousness be what it needed, wanted to be. Not needed to be, wanted to be. Sure, sure. Then there was the conscious thought of, I don't want to sound like the rest of these dudes. Yeah. Like, I don't want to. And then there was the influence of, of again, HR and, and, and John. And, 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 and HR's thing was here and John's thing was here. I was trying to find something that would put me not in the middle of them, but something where I felt like I could add on to what they had been doing absolutely I wanted to be an addition took me a while to find my voice my tone it really did i listened back to those early absolution things and i go god damn you sound like shit <laughs> i don't like the sound of my voice when i got older and we came back together in 20 when was it 2008 i had settled down i was like man had i been spitting like this when i was a kid i really would have been killing them <laughs> yeah, yeah. Family, you know how that shit goes like I settled down and I was able to find my rhythm and kind of like 
really infuse hip hop like rap sensibilities the way that Mackie did on the drums with the Cro-Mags, I was able yeah. now at fucking 38. I probably touched on it a little bit in my teens, but when I got older, remember I spent all this time in recording studios. I spent all this time making beats on drum machines. I spent all this time doing all these different things and then in house music. So I had rhythm to spare. I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to hit it like this now. Right? Yeah. Took me, took me all those years to... But when I was, but but the beautiful thing was that I, 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 like nineteen years later, twenty years later, I said, "Shit, these lyrics that I wrote as a kid were fucking." There's a lot to. Li I didn't really have to rewrite the lyrics. I had to edit certain things so sure. they would land right rhythmically. But sure. I never had to change the context of these songs because it was like they were written from a very mature place, and. They were different from, and it wasn't just like psycho babble either. You know what of I mean? Of course, yeah. It wasn't like some kid trying to be different who's just going to say some shit because it makes no sense, but to a few people who got it. When the people read the lyrics, everybody got it, but they were like, yo, this shit is. Gavin's songwriting was also a, 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 a amused for that because it was different. Sure. You know, it was, it was, he gave us uh, and all the changes and shit that he would do. And they were frantic, manic changes. Manic. It wasn't just the chorus and the, and the breakdown. Yeah, sure. He had like a lot of shit going on. I odd, know. odd meters. I don't even know that he was conscious. Like, I'm going to do some shit in an odd meter. And he just <laughs> did this shit feels good. I'm going to fucking do it fearlessly. It sounds and feels good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he did. And we were like, let's go. Um, Alan and Greg. And Greg had a had a, a very different swing. Kind of gave things somewhat of a jazzy feel at times. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. So I, I don't know that any of us were like, we're going to be this band that's going to be so different. But course, you yeah. didn't know that you had to do something to stand out from every other band in the fucking matinee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As good as 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 everybody was, there's always, there's always this. It's so easy to do what everybody's doing. That's right, and there's only so many bands that can you know have the I'm gonna I'm gonna beat your ass. Uh, you betrayed me, you know, with with beat down kind of parts. There's only so many that are going to stand out at the end of the day. And half of them are, you know, full of shit anyway. I mean, half of them aren't full of shit, but. <laughs> well, you know who is and who isn't. You know, you can look at them and, and, and their receipts and their war stories are like, this is why they're saying this. And then the other yep. ones, are, why are you saying this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why are you yeah. so mad? Like, is it cool to be angry or is this really some shit that you're trying to get out of your system before you fucking self-destruct? Yeah. 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 Um but yeah, I mean so aside from the you know the show at at CB's, are there other shows that stand out to you that just had like a certain energy or you know some some other reason why it why it stood, stood out to you? We did some crazy shit at the Anthrax up in Connecticut. Oh, really good gigs there. I don't think we had a bad gig there. Yeah. I don't think we had a bad gig there. Rock Against Racism. Oh, okay, yeah. We opened up. That was amazing. That was really fun. Um, after the riots in 88, we did, we did the show to benefit for the squatters. In Tompkins Square Park at the band show. That shit was fun. Oh, I bet. Yeah. That was fun. The riots in 88 were a trip. <laughs> Can only imagine. Yeah. That shit was crazy. Um, we did a show in a squat and the fucking floor almost fell out. <laughs> 
from underneath us. Yeah. We in the dead of winter. We played with nausea. Oh, my God. <laughs> Avenue C or some shit. In 11th Street or 13th Street or something. I don't know. Wow. Lucky 13, it was called. Wow. <laughs> we had some dope shows at the Pyramid Club. They were all fun, man. Yeah, yeah. They were all fun. I mean, when I think about it, they were all really fun and, and such a natural high and just an amazing way to spend your teenage years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, like, like, uh, like you said before, you know, you didn't, you obviously had no idea at the time the uh, influence that Absolution would come to have on, um, you know, on the scene going forward. But it, at least, at least so far with, with Bronx people from the generation after you, you know, <laughs> everyone somehow has a tie to Absolution, whether it was a, you know, first show that they saw or, or this or that. I mean, um, yeah, but obviously you don't realize that at the time. Um I didn't really realize it at the time and I didn't realize it until many years later because when I went into another avenue, I rarely looked back. And so I wasn't checking on the new bands. I had no idea who was doing what. Absolutely. I was I was my focus was somewhere completely different, although geographically not too far away, headspace was completely someplace else. So Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I I had no desire to see what type of I think at the time had I had the, the reason for me to go back, let me see what type of impact we left. It would have been completely ego driven. My ego was now driven by some other force at the time. Your ego is always your your ego is always with your art. If someone tells you it's not, I don't believe that person. Yep. Yep. Ego and art, boy, they have a love affair, bro. That shit is that. <laughs> Toxic at times, but it's beautiful when it's right. Yeah, and a place where it can just live and be who it needs to be, and you can be who you need to be without any fucking worry about is it good? Do people like it? Do I like it? You don't even have to like it. You just have to do it. Yeah, yeah. You don't even have to understand it. You have to do it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. When you're when you're out there searching for the accolades and beating your chest about how good you are and how bad everybody else is. That's, that's where the toxic side of your ego can come in. And, sure. Um, that's something that ego is not and, and, the, and, and the toxic side of it is not, uh, it's not owned by one gender, but the way that young men express it is, 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 is the way that we express it. And it's something that, in both hardcore and hip hop, you can see them as these boys clubs where it, it can get real heavy. Absolutely. The beating of the chest becomes louder than the beating of the drum. I don't want to hear this. I want to hear yeah. the drum. It gets yeah. real good and you're just like, fuck, man. I mean, rap built on the shit, hardcore built on the shit. Uh, you know, it, it's all built on it. But, you know, when it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful, it was beautiful. So I, I had no idea. It wasn't until I remember having a conversation with Sergio, like, because when we when we got back together, we played the Knitting Factory, the Knitting Factory show in in in, in August of two thousand eight was the only show we ever sold out. Well, I don't want to say that, but yeah, we headlined it and sold it out. The Knitting Factory was crazy. I had seen John down here in Miami play at this spot called Love Hate. It was a little bar that was owned by the owners of Miami Inc., Ami James and his partners. Okay, okay. Training boxing at this gym called South Florida Boxing. There was a trainer there named Doug McKinnon. And he's like, oh shit, you know? And he knew punk, cause he's a hardcore dude from back in the day. Yeah. So John performs with Mackie, with AJ, AJ, who was from Leeway. Remember AJ, the guitar? Sure, sure. And Craig was on bass. 
It might have been the second guitar player. I can't remember. But anyway, Joe was like, oh, shit, that's my man, Gigi Brown. After the show, he was like, yo, give me your number. He called me up before he left town. I was like, bro, you got to get back on stage, man. You got to do it. And at the time, there was a lot of reunions happening. I was like, man, I ain't shit in 20 fucking years. I know what I'm doing. He was like, bro, if anybody could do it, it's you. He's like, look, Gavin had asked me about a year prior, but I was like, ah. But John lit the fuse, you know? Yeah. The front man to bring the front man back out. Then he said, Look, get with your man Doug. Doug is down here. He'll help you. And so Doug and I learned these songs and we just did them with vocals and drums, no guitar, no bass. Wow. And then we did that. And that was really fun. And again, it allowed me to really lock into the rhythm and to the changes. It was hard because it was like we had to visualize. I don't even know how the fuck we did it. We listened to the song and then <laughs> I don't know how we did it. Maybe he had headphones on with the with the songs in there and was playing the drum. But I didn't hear the guitars and the bass. I was just going off the beat. Yeah, sure, sure. And we did that for a couple months out here out, out, out in the spot in Hialeah where he used to rehearse at with a couple of his bands. And that was dope. And then we went to New York and rehearsed with Gavin and, and Sergio. And then we did the Knitting Factory gig, and that shit was, that was like, that was amazing. New York City really loved us. The hardcore community came back out. I'm 38 years old. Gavin's 40. Sergio's 40. But we were at our, not but, and we were at our peak. Like, yeah. Like, we were all just like solid. Doug's about 41. We were all strong. I'm fucking in shape. Doug's in shape. Gavin's in shape. Sergio strong. Everybody was physically fucking strong. And we, here we are in our late 30s, early 40s, strong ass fucking men. And I remember hearing somebody say, or right, or whatever, it was like, the mighty absolution is back. And that was the first time I was like, oh shit, mighty. And <laughs> Sergio, I'm on the phone with him talking before the gig when I'm still down here. He's like, man, you don't fucking understand the imprint that absolution left on people. I didn't know. Yeah, sure, sure. I really, I really was like, I was like, for real? And let me tell you one thing about Sergio Vega. That man has never not told the truth. If he says something, it's how he experienced it. Yeah. It's how he heard it. It's how he lived it. And more importantly, it, 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 it's what he believes. And, you know, that's what other kind of truth can a man or can a person bring you? Like that, that, that brother has always been the most honest and truthful person that I've, that I've ever met. Mm. So when he told me those things, yeah, he's my man from back in the days, but he wasn't blowing smoke up nobody's ass. He was lighting yeah. fuse. He's adding, he's adding fuel to the shit. Like, bro, people really love the group and they love you. Like, you know, they always will. And I was like, wow, okay, fuck it. I'm in, let's do this shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just being on stage with Gavin and with Sergio and then Doug, who I just recently met at the time, but still just like that first gig at the Knitting Factory with Gavin and Sergio was just, um, I went back to the Bronx that night. I couldn't sleep. I was still smoking weed at the time. I must have stayed up until six in the morning smoking blunt after blunt. Wow. On the terrace, on my mom's terrace, looking at the Manhattan skyline, just getting high as a fuck. Like, wow, what just <laughs> what just happened, right? <laughs> that really yeah. just like, am I bugging out or what just happened? Wow, yeah, because when when you left the scene, like you mentioned, you left and you didn't look back. There was no intention on ever looking back and all of that. So, for you know almost 20 years later for it to culminate in that. I mean, who, who could have, who could have thought, I know, um, uh, had it, wow, there's still you know, plenty more we could go. I just want to check in and see how you're doing as far as, uh, well, let's, let's, let's wrap for another 15 or 20. I do have to eat a substantial meal before I yeah. go to bed at like 10 o'clock by 10 o'clock. I'm in the bed. Yeah. 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 Same 30. I'm like, the plane is about to land. You know? <laughs> um, so do you want to talk some about uh, 
absolution ending what all was going on in your life at that point how it relates to you know your general um stance on the scene at that point you know that whole development well in 89 when when absolution ended we ended musically on a high note we had a great gig we had some really good gigs and we were young men and you know we had different visions about things we went through some personnel changes and um brothers who don't fight are brothers who don't love sounds like a blanket statement but you're gonna fight with your brothers man whether they're your blood brothers in the crib you know or your brothers in the street or your brothers in bands and at the time Gavin and I locked horns on some things and we decided to go separate ways and I'm sure that it broke his heart as much as it broke mine at the time. Yeah. I had to just, I thought about doing another band, but I had to just go. I will, I will, I will, I will live and die saying because Absolution was such a, such a, and hardcore was such a small part of my life. Absolution is the only band that I was ever in, in that musical expression, in that culture. And I'm not going to make another band now at 53 and do it. I yeah, sure, sure probably won't even do a, a I don't even see myself doing a reunion again I'm in a different place but yeah Gavin and I are 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 closer than ever even if we don't speak but once a year like we never had a clash since then and we did we were young 19 and 21 and that's going to happen yeah uh, he's one of the most tenacious people I've ever met. Like he doesn't stop. The man is always seeking joy and his truth and his, and his sense of peace. And we had a lot of parallel paths in terms of martial arts and owning gyms and training. He was a big influence on my decision to, to, to do those things. So even outside of the music, like, you know, Gavin's influence in my life never left. Yeah. Never left. But I had to leave the scene. Sure. I, I just... And the sound of hip-hop and the message at that time was so strong, especially in its in its Afrocentricity and its, in its not literal call to arms, but call to consciousness. Absolutely. And I was feeling like a minority all over again in the hardcore scene, having to defend myself. And this guy's a racist. This guy's not. I was like, man, I don't want to go through this shit again. Why is it always like. Just, I don't know. It, 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 people will tell you there's no racism, but there was. Yeah, sure. Having to decipher of who's a white power skin or who's a Nazi punk or who's a this or who's a that. It's fucking exhausting shit when you can't avoid that social construct. Yeah. Because of the color of your skin, you can't avoid it. There's no way you can avoid it. You can learn how to manage it. You can learn how to deal with it. You can learn how to not let it rot you at your core but you will never in this country be able to not be faced with it it's on the fucking news it's huh? here it's there and so to come downtown certain days and someone say hey Gingy, guess what such and such called you a nigga like oh man god damn you know it's different when my man uptown called me that because he don't mean no harm by it yeah 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 it's a fucking yeah it's a double-edged sword but give us that and that fucking go downtown and you know this guy's cool one day is he a racist is he not you don't know he's cool with me but I heard all the fights that I had down there was about defending my humanity against someone who was calling me you know the n-word from a derogatory point not from that's my man yeah, sure, sure, sure. I never fought about right. nothing else. And yeah. the fuck about it was that because I was a handful of black people down there, I felt like I had the peer pressure. I have to be the one to fight about it. No one else was fighting about that shit. Uh-huh. 
not to that degree. Yeah. They were fighting about other things. Sure. Girls, drugs, ego. You said this shit about me. You stabbed me in the back. But they weren't fighting about that. Yeah. I didn't want to fucking do that shit no more. Yep. Having to prove myself and always had this fucking conversation. So, I mean, shit. KRS spitting this shit. Big Daddy King spitting this shit. Public Enemy spitting this shit. And I felt like I had to go back to the Bronx for a little bit and get rooted again in that side of myself. Absolutely. And it it it, it wasn't to the um what I'm looking for. I always kept that hardcore shit with me, even when I thought I didn't. I remember I remember fuck whoa, I remember this show I seen at 1018. Sick of it all play with Boogie Down Productions. Ask somebody about uh -huh. that. I've heard about that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, bro. This shit was crazy because I don't know if the term hardcore hip hop was used prior to that. Oh, shit. I don't know. Huh. I can say for sure that it wasn't, but I can tell you this. When Onyx came out with fucking skinheads and, 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 and black flight jackets, Paris... Mayhew from the Cro-Mags was the one who directed the video. And their song was called Slam. Uh-huh. Right? When the fucking BDP is doing their shit in the same 1018 or Roseland or wherever the fuck it was. I think it was 1018. With Sick of It All. BDP, you know, Boogie Down Production Play. I don't know who headlined what I don't know, but all I know is this. When the brothers from the Boogie Down Productions, the folks who came to hear Karis One, saw the pit, they were like, what in the fuck is this shit? <laughs> Soon afterwards. I can only imagine. <laughs> Soon afterwards, my man, you see videos with all of these thugged out rap dudes jumping all over to fuck each other. Uh, I, we I were think... dancing like... Big Daddy Kane's dancers and Chop Rock's dancers and 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 Kwame Cash was you know boom, but by the uh -huh. early nineties, I'm telling you, hardcore had a fucking impact on hip hop then. I don't know if it was the same show, but there's uh the last person I recorded an oral history with from Fahrenheit 451, a, a Bronx hardcore band. His first show was in '91 at the Marquee. He was sick of it all. Um, uh, Boogie Down Productions and Burn. I'm, I remember seeing Burn and Sick of It All. And that, I might have been there. I that must have been a wild show. I mean, like. Might have been there. But. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that, I guess, you know, to your point about New York at the time, I mean, there were possibilities for that kind of thing yeah, and at the time. Especially in Manhattan, especially downtown. If it was going to happen anyway, it was going to happen there, like that. To yep. that yeah, little pockets. I mean, you know, still, I mean, you know, mo mo most white hardcore kids probably weren't going to be too deep into into hip-hop, and most people into hip-hop weren't going to be well, too deep into no, hardcore. But there were... That, that, that's actually, I'm, I'm going to, I'll challenge you on that because... Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So, because of people like the Beastie Boys. Oh, sure, yeah. Dante Ross. There was always, there was always, you know, because of that West Side crew, because of people like Rest in Peace, Gibi, um, there was always, there was always those, 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 those white brothers down there, various ethnicities that were, yo, they they knew hip hop as well as they knew punk and hardcore. It was right hand, left hand, left hand, right hand. They embodied this shit. Yeah. They really did. And and it was cats like that. I mean, Dante and Gibi producing fucking the the, the SD fifties. They producing brand Nubian album, brand oh, Nubian sure, album. Sure. Albums. They're God body. They're five percenters, bro. Uh huh. But the SD fifties produced them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Dante Ross is like he's another one of those dudes who is 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 is, is a pillar. In the culture, not in the crossover. I don't believe in that. In the culmination, sure. in the culmination, sure. right? 
people always use this word crossover. Like, ain't nobody crossing over shit. It's a blend, dude. That's right. It, it's a blend. It's a blend. So now maybe your point is that some of the kids and you know, they they might hate me for this, but it's all right. We grown ass men. When you had the influx of a lot of suburban middle class, upper middle class white kids, maybe yes, yes, yes. Education or the statement that you made, but New York City white kids, nah. They look. You even you even on Riverton Street had Mars, man, and then you had fucking the the the, the, the in in the in the there was always hip hop clubs that like hardcore kids were going to because the shit was dope. It was always a few hardcore kids that were like, look, we're going to go to this club, we're going to go to Milky Way, we're going to go here, we're gonna we're gonna go there, we're gonna always. Gavin was a fucking bouncer or doorman in a lot of these clubs. There was always the culmination, not the crossover. There was always the culmination. I think it was more so with suburban kids from yep. the state area and the New Jersey's and, you know, like the same type of kids who, oh man, fuck it. You know, not kids, but the same, like, oh, let's go to let's go to New York City and get some drugs and shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's that shit. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, cause to to your point much earlier, you know, it it it, it was all it was all like one one culture. I mean, obviously, different manifestations in every neighborhood. Got different right? ingredients in the same pot, yeah. man. It's, it's yep. like, yep. It's I mean, and, 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 you know, I think I think there were certain moments where, uh, you know, you can't even really talk about hardcore and hip hop as as separate genres because it was just all part of the same the same pot, you know. At a, at a certain point, absolutely. I mean, at a certain point, it was like. A double feature as a matinee, you know, yep. it, was, it was just, it's what it was. Yep. yep. I know they both had influence on each other and I was a part of the, of, 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 of the conversational exchange, but damn sure not a pioneer in it, just a part of it, a, a spectator. That's right. Yeah. I was a spectator that found a space and was privileged enough to get on stage and share that energy. But if you're not a fan first, if you're not a toy first, if you're not, you know, if, if you're not that first, you never fully appreciate the shit. You gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be in the rafters, man. You gotta be in the bleachers. Yeah. On a hot fucking day to really love a Yankees game. If you're lucky enough to get the fucking third baseline or the first baseline, you privileged, but but those of us that watch Yankees games in the 70s and 80s with the grandfather, with the big brothers and the bleachers and his fucking... <laughs> <all his fucking, laughs> really loved the Yankees, you know what I mean? Like, you really loved them because this shit was uncomfortable, bro. It wasn't nothing fly about being in the bleachers. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, so, uh, I think this is probably a natural stopping point because, you know... The, the the next chapter of your next chapters of your life are uh are you know really rich and long chapters that deserve you know attention of their own uh as well i mean you know <laughs> you, you, hell you're what when when absolution ended you were what night was it 20 that was 19 19 19 so yeah barely out of high school and there's there's so much more of your life after that I know, um, so I don't want to rush that part, because um, you know I I think it'd be great to get into uh, all of the different albums that you worked on um, afterwards as an engineer and uh, and you know all of your musical journey since, um, but uh, but I don't want to I don't want to keep you starving before bed. <laughs> Well, I appreciate the um, I appreciate you reaching out, appreciate the follow through, appreciate the conversation, and I appreciate you and your demeanor and 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 your project. So, um, I'm definitely open to revisiting the conversation, but thank you for the time and for the you know for the platform to 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 speak and hopefully, it 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 it, it adds, you know, some value to your um to your project. Well, it will, it will, and why? Well, I, I actually have one, one final question, uh, just to throw at you tonight. Uh, hopefully, it won't take. Well, I, I sometimes people take take a long time on, on this, but, um, but for the sake of your hunger, uh, 
hopefully it, it won't take too long, but um, uh, what does the Bronx mean to you? It's my heart. It's my heart. That's it. My heart will always beat it. That's it's my heart, man. Yeah. It's my heart. And specifically, the Soundview section is the only place in the block in the Bronx I ever lived. I didn't live in any other place. I didn't That's live right. in any other neighborhood. I, That's I, right. I, I, this holiday season. I was very nostalgic for my neighborhood and thinking about the brothers and sisters I grew up with that aren't here anymore and thinking about the ones that are still here. And yeah, I, 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 we all want a piece of land. Very few of us in the country will ever own one, but the American dream is rooted in land, which is why people who are underserved, undernourished, underpoliticized, underrepresented. We do crazy shit representing our hood because it's the only piece of land that we know. It's a yeah. natural Bible human instinct to 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 claim land as your own. When people tell you that it's not, and people fight for land and people get pushed off of land and there's reasons why and you know, and well, you people can't get yourself out the ghetto and and then people come in and buy up the ghetto and push the people out the ghetto who couldn't get out the ghetto. The fight for land and the land gets very specific. The land produces fruit. It produces food. It produces people. It produces culture and culture is specific and it's regional. It's not just American culture or New York culture or Bronx culture, or hardcore culture. There's little niche in every bit. And I'm from the Soundview area of the Bronx, specifically Story Avenue. That's where my story starts. That's where it it ends in the Bronx. When I left the Bronx, I left Story Avenue. Yeah. And that place, Morrison and Story, Boynton and Story, the Six Train, the Two Train, the Bruckner Boulevard, the Westchester Avenue, the Yankee Pizza. That shit is in my heart, bro. So the Bronx, it's not about hip hop or hardcore graffiti. No, I don't. Eh. Yeah. Those are the extremities. Yeah, sure. Heart, bro. So that's what the Bronx means to me. It's, it's, it's my heart. Well, really, really wonderful speaking with you tonight. Uh, and thank you for taking so much time and for sharing so much. And uh, look forward to speaking more with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. You have a good night, thank, man. Thank you. You too. And make sure you send me that thing again. I'll sign it for you tomorrow. I will. I'm going to stop the recording now. All right. You got it. Go. Uh,